show seven o'clock. Don't look at the clock on the wall. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the PNZ Commission meeting here for uh, September the 25th. Uh, just might as well start here. Approval of minutes in the previous meeting. Everyone had a chance to review and preview if there's any changes or uh, if not, we would accept a motion to pass those, please. I'll second. Okay. Fairberry, motion. You get Hadley a second. Go ahead and roll call that, Megan, please. Alexi Cowell. Aye. Hadley Gilbert. Aye. Adam Braille. Aye. Jeff Garrison. Aye. Trevor Bridge. Aye. William Oates. Stay. Pete Renfro? Aye. Lacey Colbert? Aye. And Chad Aye. Thank you very much. With no scheduled visitors or guests or unfinished business, we'll jump right into the new business, letter A. It says, an ordinance amending the municipal code of the City of Ozark, Missouri, Chapter 405, relating to zoning regulations. Mr. Smith, you have the floor. Yes, uh, following the last meeting, uh, staff has went back and, and made some corrections or updates to the ordinance just to hit those highlights of those revisions uh, and, and add one in there that we didn't have before that we we caught, uh, and that's in regards to group homes. So you'll see that that has been stricken from the ordinance as a conditional use. Based on the state statutes and the Federal Housing Act, uh, we cannot restrict the group homes any differently than a single family. So we have removed that from the ordinance. Um, and then following on, uh, we've corrected the, the shells and maze that we had found in the ordinance that should have been a shell. So we got that addressed. And then the, the two items that was uh, the primary discussions last meeting was in regards to the pool and the community room or pool house. Uh, staff has went back and, and made some changes to that. Uh, we, we, up, we increased the required minimum loss to, to kick in the pool requirement. Uh, the pool house, community room, uh, we give some stipulations there about the minimum sizes for that. Uh, basically, what we've determined there is based on the developer, developer's design professional, they shall build a, or design the pool house to accommodate the total pool occupant load uh, based on the final pool size calculations. Uh, so it doesn't really give any minimums in there, but it does is determined by the building codes as far as an occupant load, what the pool will handle after they calculate that size. So we've made those changes in the ordinance. And then moving on to the, the other primary discussion was in regards to the sidewalks and trails. Uh, what staff is doing is we went back and just minimized that requirement and just referred more to the, the City of Ozarks design standards for public improvements and the linear park trails and construction requirements uh, in the linear park trail construction ordinance uh, that's in chapter 410. Uh, so we are referring to that. And then the second item on this agenda is the updated trail linear park trail ordinance. Uh, with that, be happy to answer any questions. We made the same modifications in RSF2 as well. Right. Okay. Thank you. We'll go ahead and uh, moving forward, open it up to the public for any questions or comments uh, to this ordinance. Request to change. Anyone? Yes, sure. Come forward. Jeannie Metfall, 1324 East Warren Avenue, Ozark, Missouri. I do appreciate you changing it from the 34 or 35 lots up to 75 lots. I still feel like you might want to rethink this a little bit more because a lot of people can't afford a homeowners association to maintain a pool. And we're looking at allowing for affordable housing in Ozark where people in the service industry are teachers and a lot of people cannot afford that extra fee that's gonna be charged to them not knowing what the insurance is going to be on a pool for a homeowners association, the maintenance of it, and what happens if we go through a year like we did in 2008 and people are foreclosed on and then nobody's there to pay that fee. So then who's going to maintain it? So it's just something I thought you might want to think about a little bit further because you're making it mandatory that there's some kind of homeowners association that's going to be required to pay for this common area. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Miles Ross. I'm with the Greater Home Builders, uh, Greater Springfield Home Builders Association. Uh, and I'm your home address, please. And my home address is 2188 North of Firm, Springfield, Missouri. Thank you. And I actually live in Wild Horse, and I'm the vice president of our neighborhood association. And I want to talk about the pools a little bit as well. The 75, 76 number might be a little small uh, just for price. I mean, housing is very unaffordable right now. And Springfield, as you know, there's more renters that live in Springfield than homeowners. And what we're seeing nationally is prices are just skyrocketing, whether it's COVID, labor, you know, housing, lots, whatever, it's very expensive. So just take a lot of consideration on that, please. I can tell you uh, in Wild Horse, we're getting ready to replace one of our pools. And it's, you know, we've got almost a thousand homes out there and we have two pools. And they're not overcrowded and they're not overrun, but they are very expensive. Uh, we're, we're looking at about 200 to 250,000 to replace one of those pools. So as this lady was saying, I mean, that's very expensive. And we have a lot of homeowners paying almost $1,000 a year to dues. And we've been saving that money up for 15 years. So we will be able to replace it, but we're going to have to probably do a special assessment. Um, and so I'm really concerned about, you know, the medium or lower end homeowner and what it'll do to housing here. So you could get a lot of subdivisions that might be 75 homes and nobody's going to go over that cap because that saves a huge expense. Or you're going to get a really big subdivision, you know, maybe. But uh, what I think what it'll do is a lot of our builders have told me uh, they'll just go somewhere else to go to Republic, to go to Webster County, to go somewhere else. So uh, I just want you all to think about the unintended consequences. I think your ideas are really good. And who doesn't want to live in a really nice community like Ozark? But just think about the prices and where we're at in this economy, because things are going to get worse. Uh, we're seeing a lot of economic information data uh, that things are just now starting to slow down. So, you know, they were talking about a recession all this year. Well, we've got inflation. But the recession is not yet hit. Uh, so it's looking like potential in the next two years. We'll have a really serious slowdown in housing. So just want y'all to consider that. And we're happy to provide any information, whether it's from our local or from National uh, Home Builder Association, to help you make any decisions that you want. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, don't see a move, so I'll go ahead and close the public portion uh, over this ordinance and go ahead and open it up to the commissioners for any questions or comments that we might have for staff. Yes, sir. I have a question for staff. Uh, Cameron, can you go over um, how how the staff came to the to the seventy six number? Uh, maybe what sort of research or, or information you used to, to base that on? Yeah, as you recall from the last uh, proposal, we were actually a lot less, 30. Uh, staff was given the direction by our city administrator to increase that to 75, and that's where that number came from. Yeah. Sir, go ahead. I was just curious if we have, you know, approximate maintenance cost on pools. We don't necessarily have approximate any maintenance cost, but what, what staff is finding, a lot of our subdivisions don't have an active HOA. They don't have an active uh, uh, program to maintain their own common areas. We struggle nearly daily, weekly on maintenance of those. And when they refuse to have an HOA, uh, it falls back to either each personal in that in that property either get it maintained or they can reach out to the original developer or mow it themselves. Uh, there has been discussions about tax assessments on each year if, if the city has to, to pay to maintain those. Uh, but but the discussion that came about uh, probably three years ago now about the plan for this uh, was to help encourage getting those active HOAs so they can take care of their common areas. Just a grammatical connection on page five on G, at the very end of that, it says linear park trials, or is it supposed to be trails? It should be trails. Yep. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? 
Oh, I'm sorry, Chad. Let me see. Oh, oh, Another question for staff. Is you mentioned the, the HOAs, and I know that is a problem. My firsthand experience living in a large subdivision with no HOA and a lot yeah. of common areas. Does does I mean for my benefit, does the city require, you know, now in the current code, do you require an HOA at some certain number? We we have modified the ordinance uh probably two years, maybe a year and a half ago, that specifically does require the developer to put on the plat. Uh, all common areas shall be owned and maintained by the HOA. If, however, if that dissolves, it does default back to the individual lot owners in that subdivision. So, so they don't have to maintain an HOA, but it it clearly defines that if there isn't one, then it's on the homeowners and not the city. Yeah. I have a question. Um, are there any parameters on what a you know the development contains seventy five lots or less? I mean, what stops a developer from doing a phase one of 75, then basically doing a phase two of a number of another 75, but under a different name or something like that? Like you, you know, like you have in yeah. Springfield, you have Wild Horse and Lakes at Wild Horse, yeah. like you have different things like that. What um, I'm guess I'm saying, you know, understanding how trying to manage this. Um, you know, what, what defines a development, I guess, according to the city ordinance? So the way it would be defined is uh, if it's the same name, future phases like phase one, two, and three, that would all be calculated for the this calculation. But if some new developer comes in, changes it, it's a different name, different subdivision, then it would initially start all over in the process. Well, I think... If, maybe if I need to ask it another, another way, are there safeguards to keep multiple 75 lot developments from occurring one after another after another under the same ownership? Not necessarily specifically in this ordinance. That was one of the reasons why the lot number was lower down to that 30 initially was to kind of prevent some of that. And based on what we're seeing for subdivisions development, also that 30 lot number was also in alignment with the International Fire Code about that secondary access requirement uh, or sprinkling of homes. And that's why that 30 was initially proposed. Uh, but at this point now, there really isn't a safeguard that would prevent a developer from doing that. Yes, Trevor. Yes, I had a quick question. Um, as far as the home occupations, they require the conditional use permits, like the the daycare centers, preparation of food. I noticed that was stricken out. I was kind of curious why that was. That was stricken out because of the state statute now no longer allows us to limit those through a conditional use process. And that was stricken out of the other one back when it was originally adopted the RSF two, uh, but RSF one still had to believe in there. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? As we ponder, if anyone, again, to reiterate when we bring it up for motion, we are bringing it up in an affirmative tone, and then each vote will either approve or deny, as we, everybody remember that from last time? <laughs> I'll leave it in your hands. I have one more question. Yes, sir. Hey, I know Nixa seems like they have a lot more pools and things like that. What's the number in Nixa? Do we know? Is it seven? Is it, it seems definitely lower than it is here for now. Yeah. I'm not aware that Nix actually has a minimum requirement, but what, what kind of started a lot of this discussion uh, a few years ago, we took the Planning Zoning Commission round a tour with Nixa. Uh, what we were finding, that was back when we had a some minimum lot sizes that were fairly large. Uh, based on our findings from Nixa, what they ran into when they modified their codes, I think back in maybe 2012, it's been several years ago, uh, they had found where they've actually allowed for a, a decrease in lot size. They were seeing a lot of developers naturally provide more amenities. Uh, but at this time, I'm not aware that they have a minimum to require. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
I guess I'd just like to state some comments. So I, I, I do think there is a, an issue with, with subdivisions not having a homeowners association and having common, common areas and, and things. And, and it's definitely a challenge to maintain those. Um, uh, you know, they get overgrown, sinkholes open up, um, you know, things get damaged and, and nobody's, you know, there to, 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 you know, repair those things. You got to work together as a, as a neighborhood. But, you know, I think this is, I think this is a good tool to, to help address that. I think, you know, obviously if you move into a subdivision with, with a pool and other amenities and HOA, I mean, I think that that's going to help keep that HOA body together and falling apart. I don't know if it's the, the, uh, you know, the perfect answer or solution, but I mean, I've, I've lived in a, in a, in a neighborhood where we paid 40 bucks a month and that was for sewer and we had nothing. So I would gladly pay a hundred dollars a month for a pool, <laughs> but you know, so um, anyway, I guess based on that, I guess my comments, I, you know, I, I plan to support this, this, uh, this proposed change of the ordinance. And, and um, I think it's a, it's a good step forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chad. We have an idea of what average HOA costs are in Springfield, or if there's a, difference between HOA with pool or without a pool? No, we don't necessarily have an average. We don't track the requirements of that as far as uh, what they charge. However, when we started doing this research back a few years ago, what we were finding was the subdivisions in those are that had a pool, had a, a an active HOA that took care of their subdivision. The subdivisions that didn't have a pool uh, tend to not have an HOA or, or a process to take care of their common areas. We have an idea on the proportion of HOA homes versus non HOA owned communities for Ozark. Not off the top of my, my head, I would have an average of what those are. Uh, just guessing is probably 50 50, but I, I don't know. Well, I'll just kind of make a comment on my own. Uh, we lived in Turnberry Estates. <laughs> for 14 years no hoa useless developer and i personally mowed all but one retention center the whole time that we lived there because nobody else would and mosquitoes were horrendous and it's just a pure example of the lack of hoa it was terrible in that and i think there was you can help me i think 400 or around 400 homes there and I canvassed over half of them and nobody wanted to be a part of the HOA they wouldn't even they didn't even want to help mold <laughs> their retention says want to live in their house I guess it's kind of where I got but it was very frustrating uh, but I do think this is a good step if nothing else to require an agent. in big subdivisions you've got to have help to maintain those things i think but with all that said it's i think we're to the point of making a motion to proceed or what have you yes Lacey, if you've got something do we have like an average size of development like are most of them i guess everyone is different but do we have are most of them over 75 or Generally, we don't see them build that or much more than that in the first phase. They are bigger, but they will break it up into phases. Sometimes it is dependent on their secondary access. So they'll build those first slots until they can build phase two to get the secondary access out. Um, but when they're fully developed, are bigger. I mean, the, the, the prominent subdivisions are quite a bit bigger than 75. Yes, sir, Jen. First off, I'll say Commissioner Garrison, I think I've taken your place in Turnberry. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> with, <laughs> with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve the, the uh, I, I'll just say item 4A on the agenda as presented by staff. Do we have a second? Pete, second. A roll call vote, please, Megan. Lynn Aye. Trevor Grant. Aye. Lacey Fulbert? Aye. Alexi Pablo? Aye. Jeff Garrison? Aye. Kathleen Goldberg? Aye. 
Pete Renfro? Aye. Adam Brown? Nay. Chad Dickens? Aye. Okay, thank you. Moving on to letter B, second item on the new business is an ordinance amending the municipal code of the city of Ozark, Missouri, sections 410.5 and 410.510 regarding linear park trail and connector trail requirements. Mr. Smith. Yes, uh, as we were going through the revisions and the comments and feedback, initially in the single family ordinance, there was a requirement in there along all roads to have a five foot wide sidewalk on one side and a 10 foot wide trail on the other in the southern region. Uh, that was based on direction staff that we got from some of the board members in the prior revisions. Uh, and then based on the feedback of the recent commission, there, there was some concern about the amount of public sidewalk and roads that would be required. Uh, staff tend to to agree with some of that because we didn't only maintain a lot of that infrastructure. And that would become a lot to take care of. So, so with the revision single family ordinance, we took that requirement out and had just referred to the public works design standard which requires a sidewalk on both sides of a collective residential street in the subdivision and a sidewalk on one side of a local residential street. And then there's a section about linear park trail. Uh, if a subdivision fall, fell with on, on, in the, uh, the OTO trail alignment, we actually have mapped a lot of those trails. Uh, that subdivision was required to dedicate a 30 foot wide east in that subdivision to not build the trail. Uh, in addition to that, there was what was called the neighborhood local trails. Uh, a neighboring subdivision to that subdivision would have had to build a neighborhood trail along with connecting to that uh, trail set in the local or the, the adjacent subdivision that would have had that primary spine. Uh, as staff was reading that ordinance, it was becoming really difficult for us to understand what that really meant. It was an ordinance that was adopted uh, 2016, 2014, uh, and it was a similar ordinance that was in place in Springfield. Uh, so as we were reviewing that, trying to, to better define and clarify what the goal is to provide connectivity throughout subdivisions, we're just proposing now to uh, completely refill or replace that ordinance with a new ordinance that's about half the page in length, uh, but it gets this what we want. So, so taking that ordinance a step further, so now if your subdivision occurs along one of those fine trails, uh, as opposed to just dedicating easement, we are requiring that subdivision developer to dedicate easement and build a 10 foot wide public trail. And then if your subdivision is along one of those adjoining subdivisions, you would have to build that neighborhood linking trail. Uh, the prior ordinance required to be six feet wide. We're going ahead and bring it up to our public trail standard of 10 feet wide. Uh, so that's what the clarifications are on this board is, is to address some of those concerns that that staff was given uh, from the board about having connectivity and more public. Mm -hmm. With that, we have any answer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Cameron. Well, as before, with uh, this ordinance request, I'll be opening it up to the public for anyone that would like to speak to the linear trail, uh, excuse me, linear park trail ordinance. I just have a clarification on the linear park trail. You, you did her name again. I'm Jeannie McFall. You're good. Oh, sorry. Uh, when you discussed this a uh, few meetings back, you were talking about 10 foot out in front of somebody's house and five foot, and then you were concerned that somebody might use the 10 foot sidewalk to park on. So the linear trail will not be out in front of the house. So there won't be any miscommunication about somebody parking on it. Cameron. Do, do you yeah. remember that discussion? Yeah. yeah, that was that's always a concern. Sorry, that's always a concern with the trails and as wide as they are. However, we're not determining exactly where it has to be as long as they provide it through. I will say in a lot of cases they tend to put those in more of the common area or the drainage areas or where a sewer line might be. Uh, but we are not dictating that they have to be on a street or curb. Uh, I think our goal is to have it more of a meandering trail within the subdivision. That sounds good. That was just a question that you guys have brought up because you were afraid people were going to park on it thank in you. front of their house. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, again, with no movement, we'll go ahead and close the public portion uh, for this ordinance and open it up to commissioners for questions and comments. Anyone?
I'll start. Um, this may be not applicable, but I know in the past, more than there has been a requirement specifically on sidewalks in a few of our previous subdivisions, contractors, developer, well, I guess developers have asked, I don't know if that's right or not. There has been the availability of an escrow account to be created in case they don't, they've already set the money aside. Well, I think you've mentioned it always ends up the city has to kind of ramrod that through if that ever happens. Is that an option here or no? It wasn't necessarily an option that we've identified in this ordinance, but we can coordinate with public works to possibly allow that. The reason we do for sidewalks is because it makes a lot of sense to not have the developer build all that, then tear out nearly a third of that on each lot to build the driveway. In this case, I, I don't see that potentially happening because we don't escrow uh, those in what we call for our TCOs or plotting of a subdivision. In this case, I, I see that they'll be required to build that and not escrow the trail. Uh, however, that, that would be up to the liberty of the public works director to make that call. Okay, thanks. I have a, just more of a curiosity question for any developmentable uh, land in Ozark. Do you get a lot of calls from developers checking on trails and things like that? Um, when you when you ask that question, I'm trying to understand. So if they have to build those or if there's some in the area or... I guess my question is if, if there's a piece of land for sale, um, realtors don't usually, you know, check for the city's planning or if there's any trails there. So I'm just curious how often that do developers often check for any required easements uh, the, and are they recorded? Like, will this be recorded on all future um, trail maps, I guess? The, generally, they don't just approach us before they ever get something started. If they look, are looking at property, looking at buying, looking at development. We'll have pre-application meetings. That's when we'll sit down with them and talk about the linear park trail mapping system where it's required. Um, and then and then when the, that is required, it is part of the plat that gets recorded that shows that easement. So, yes, it does get recorded with the plat. Um, I would say most of our developers that have developed in Ozark know that that this potentially is a requirement depending on where they're located. So so they could reach out, but most cases it's more of a pre-application meeting before they ever start drafting anything that we we have those discussions. Anyone else? I actually have one more. Uh, letter D, the alternative recommendations. It basically says the director of planning and development shall make a recommendation to the planning and zoning commission regarding alternatives to requiring a neighborhood lineal park connector where a connector is not feasible due to physical or natural barriers. Have we ran, have we ran into any specifics yet that we know what those alternatives may be or could be? Not necessarily. That was something that was in there before. So when the developer is proposing a plat, staff can work with them to see what those recommendations alternatives could be. Uh, and it may be that, you know, maybe there is a case that needs to run more along the, the street system just to just based on what's going on in subdivision. Uh, we also have some uh, criteria in here to allow for some flexibility uh, due to site constraints for a minimum easement or reducing that easement. Uh, but at this time, that was just a, a carryover from what was in there before. Uh, but I don't have anything specific to propose. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. I think I'm saying I move to approve uh, 4B on new business, the ordinance amending the municipal code for the linear park trail. Roll call vote, please. Patrick Wolford? Aye. Alexi Pavlov? Aye. Trevor Grant? Aye. Adam Brown? Aye. Jeff Garrison? Aye. Pete Brinfro? Aye. Lynn Oak? Aye. Lacey Culver. Aye. Thank you very much.
Well, that takes care of the new business. Uh, we have a option for discussion, which we probably just move into a commission comments. I don't think anything tonight needs to be discussed any further. Anyone? Staff comments, Mr. Smith. Yes, um, I'm not sure if most of you are aware. Uh, there has been a Brick Street remodel project going on uh, for the Planning and Development Office. Uh, if you're familiar with where the police department is and public works over on the Brick Street building, uh, there was a remodel in, in two of those bays uh, to accommodate the Planning and Development Office. Uh, so as of the first week of October, we will be transitioning moving from City Hall to that area. Once we are over there, uh, the city is going to start remodeling our current location for the city attorney's office. They will transition to city hall. And then once they're out of the Brick Street building, there'll be a third phase of remodel for the police department to infill to the attorneys or our law department's office. So, so uh, be some moving pains for us for a few days. Uh, hopefully it's up and running and, and as we're moving in, uh, but we are scheduled the first week of October to start that move. Start. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. This space, will stay this space will stay the same and unfortunately I'll have to keep my key to City Hall to open this door. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, Megan, do you have anything? I do not. You do not. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, this would be the City of Oldbark and Nixa are in a friendly competition between the mayors on the community plus their blood drive. It happens every year. Well, this is the fourth year it's going to be taking place. And uh, for the last three years, it wasn't also it was one. So we finally figured out who had. Again, it's a good competition between the and the blood center. The main thing is the blood center blood stays here, helps our people. I met Josie, who's an ultra, who the keynote of the victim the last two years. She had to have had the blood there and fusion every week. So therefore, it is a great need for donations. And so therefore, tomorrow, first batch of church here at Old Earth, next to the post office, from 10.30 to 4.30, they'll be there asking us to get blood. Yes, well, I can have a trophy to the mayor's office. <laughs> no, yes. The main thing, though, single lives will be affected and for the better if you be able to donate tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Well, with that statement, the only thing left is number eight. If anyone like to initiate that? <laughs> Second? All in favor, say aye. Aye. And was it Star Trek? Make it so number one? <laughs>